Hello and welcome to The Organ Grinder and You. This is part of an ongoing series that takes deep dives into different aspects and areas of Kingdom Death, seeking to get in, right into the nitty gritty of whatever a given thing is all about. We are currently working our way through the settlement locations and this is another one of the crafting level one settlement locations. The crafting level one indicates that it comes from the directly from the Lantern Horde or whichever central uh, location, starting location for your settlement you have. There are three of these. The Skinnery focuses around defences via armour and a little bit of bleed protection. The Bonesmith concentrates on offence with a little bit of resource generation and small amount of defence. And the Organ Grinder concentrates on the glue that sticks everything else together. Most gear cards come in one of three different primary categories, either weapons, armour or items. Weapons are things you swing to hurt monsters, and armor's stuff that you use to not get decimated by a monster when it hits you. And then items are pretty much everything else. They cover a huge different number of options. We'll see a few of them here in this organ grinder location, but they're incredibly broad, and they can do a lot to bring different builds fully to life. We'll start, though, with the endeavors. We'll begin with our settlement unlock endeavor. Uh, this is spending an endeavor, three organs and a hide to unlock the barber surgeon. Before we get into the circumstances of where I would typically unlock the barber surgeon, I'm just going to talk about the cost. And this is a broad thing that apply to every single aspect of this particular video. So. For me, there are two ways that I consider resources I'm spending on doing something. The first one is very direct. It's the resource cost. It's right here. We see it's three organ and a hide. So four resources total, mixed between organs and hides. That's self-explanatory. But I also personally use a system of valuing. So this system is based upon the rough ratios of how you're going to have the different uh, gear crafted in your gear grid. So a survivor has nine slots and in a typical average early game gear grid you're going to have a full set of rawhide armor, a weapon and then probably three support items or maybe another weapon somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. So that's where I derive my value um, and this value changes from one moment to the next. It also changes depending on whether you're dealing with a monster or, or a basic or a perfect resource. Scarcity does also matter. So I thoroughly recommend you do not take my ratios as the literal only truth. Figure out what ratios you want to use to sort of get an idea of whenever you're doing something, how much is this actually costing the settlement as a whole can i afford to do this given thing or craft this given thing right now or is there other stuff that's more important my ratio is i value bones at one point in the early game i value organs at three or four points in the early game and i value hide at five points this just comes from the ratio i previously mentioned i need five hide three organs and a bone to get a very bog standard basic completely full nine slot gear grid Although typically I'm actually going to leave one slot free and sometimes if it's monster grease that actually costs two organs. So that's where I get mine from and that means this location is pretty expensive to unlock. It's not as expensive as the leather worker which comes from the skinnery but still this is the second most expensive of the options. Right. Now the real question is, when are you going to unlock the Barbered Surgeon? Should you ever rush to make it and get it unlocked as fast as possible? I think you should always be a bit measured with the Barber Surgeon. Um, previous experiences, you could, didn't even have this in older editions. You got the Barber Surgeon through the Screaming Antelope. 
this change is really good, by the way. This change here is just well done to the design team for making this change. Um, it is fantastic for the health of the game. But uh, this is a high cost. So the general times that I will think about unlocking the Barber Surgeon are I've already built most of either two or three Survivor early game gear grids. To get a more concrete example of what that would be, I've built two or three Rawhide armor sets and I've got the support items from the organ grinder that I wanted to get through my organ use. And very importantly, I have bandages somewhere. And then I'll start thinking about unlocking this. But it's impossible to give you an exact lantern year because there is no precise science on when you should be unlocking these various different things. Um, you're going to learn through feel and generally whether you have spare resources kicking around and the endeavour you can spend, it'll vary. But there are also a few specific circumstances I will consider pushing to open the, organ, the barber surgeon from the organ grinder a bit faster than normal. The first one is if I happen to get a perfect hide, which you see here. This supreme textured uh, resource is very rare. There's only one in the basic resource deck. Uh, so it's a lucky drop if you get it. It can be used to make a really great item in the Barber Surgeon that will help improve your resource generation for the rest of the campaign. So I will push to get the Barber Surgeon open if I get a perfect hide because I can spend a perfect hide on something really, really great. The other one is the perfect organ. This is actually less of a I'll push to do it exactly as quickly as possible as compared to the perfect hide because I don't think the organs, the organ based uh, cards in the Barber Surgeon are as powerful as the hide ones. Usually you need to support the organ based ones with specific gear grids, but I will, I will try and get going because some of my favorite overall utility cards use the perfect organ. So that's the considerations. The last one is if I have a survivor who has picked up a crippling disorder, like say apathetic, which is absolutely terrible for a uh, survivor in the early game because not having survival and not being able to gain courage especially the survival bits, this no use or gain of survival is horrific for an early game settlement. So I will consider unlocking the Barber Surgeon if say my fist and tooth or shield or spear trained survivor gets hit with something like apathetic, something that stops them being able to go out and hunt anymore. That's because the Barber Surgeon has an endeavor that will let you get rid of disorders. So that's the Barber Surgeon unlock. Um, and it's more something you're going to do to around, well, before Lantern Year 10, probably, um, but certainly not in the first few Lantern Years. You've got far more important things to be doing with these resources. Then let's look at the other endeavour. The Organ Grinder is the first settlement location most players will encounter that has a separate endeavour on it that isn't just unlocking another settlement location. This is one of the most important settlement location endeavors in the entire game because it can trigger intimacy. And intimacy is one of the few ways you can get more population and it is the main way you're going to be getting population. It's very straightforward. You spend an endeavor, you roll a dice, you check this chart. But as you can see, this chart doesn't automatically give you intimacy. And there's a few more wrinkles and bits and pieces that you want to bear in mind when you're doing augury. So first up, uh, if you have a survivor with three or higher, you should use them to ponder the meaning of existence uh, because they'll add one to this result, which means you get intimacy on a seven plus and you have a less of a chance of this triggering. The second thing is to think about this result here. You have to spend the resource if you roll this. You will gain plus one understanding, but you have to. So the trick 
is to make sure you've spent all of the resources you care about before you start doing augury or you have some resources you don't care about losing and you'd like to train them for trade them for understanding because it'll help you get to this extra understanding and trigger the uh, insight unlock which is great for survivors when it's done in the settlement phase in particular usually that means you'll sacrifice a scrap scrap is very weak in the very in the earliest parts of the campaign it gets stronger the longer the campaign runs for or a bone because as mentioned before bones are probably the least valuable resource you will normally end up with a lot of bones kicking around in your settlement storage the longer you go on so as long as everyone's got a usable weapon this is a fine thing to spend also there is a spot in lantern year one where you always should augury and that is if the first story has given you max population and you've got back from the prologue fight without losing any survivors because you'll have 14 survivors total 14 survivors is one short of unlocking a principle on the milestone on your settlement sheet. You should go for that if you can. Um, I'm not going to go into more detail about population management here. That's its own video. There's a lot to talk about. But because we are mentioning the organ grinder and the usage of organs, I wanted to mention Love Juice here and highlight it. This gives you intimacy without rolling on the table. That's fantastic. Uh, obviously the survivors who use this have to be able to consume so they can consume it. Um, these, you want to be clever with when you use these, but you do not want to hold on for them or hold on to them for too long because sometimes events can remove things from your settlement storage. So there is tricks involved with this. Uh, I would say if I came back from the prologue hunt to, and arrived at the settlement for the first time and we were at 14 population, I would be using this straight away, but otherwise I'd be saving it until I've got other ways of improving population growth. So that is all of the endeavours, and we're now going to take a look at these six gear cards. So here is our organ grinder deck, and we are going to start with stone noses, which are right here. So the stone noses were added in, I believe, 1.5, and they are one of the only gear cards in the game that don't require an actual card-based resource. They just use your Endeavor resources. So stone noses are something you just want to remember exist. And there's a few reasons they are quite good beyond the fact that this is a super efficient crafting cost. First of all, jewellery. So there's some really, really good jewellery in Kingdom Death. Really good. And white lions, if you suffer a defeat against them, steal jewellery. A piece of jewellery. Having a stone nose in your gear grid on any of the survivors means in the terrible situation that you suffer a party wipe, you can lose a stone noses instead of losing a more valuable gear card. Um, we'll talk about one of the most valuable early game ones when we get to the Catarium. Apart from that, it does a couple of other neat things. It gives you a survival on arrival and gives you an insanity. So while you always want to depart with at least some survival, gaining it in the showdown is incredible because it means you can ignore uh, or not ignore but not worry about survival costs during the hunt you can spend it on gaining benefits or avoiding dying things like that so this is a really good ability here and the insanity even provides you some protection when you arrive at the showdown even if you lost all of your insanity on the way in so this is a great item and the only real big negative to it is the lack of affinities but i think that is fair given how strong this item is. So it's okay to have four of these. If you've got space in your gear grids, probably not ever going to craft that many of them, but it is definitely worth always remembering that a spare endeavor can become a piece of gear. And this piece of gear can do so many different things because disposable gear on the hunt is amazing uh, on top of the jewelry protection. Next up, we have the fecal salve. So the Fecal Salve costs a single organ. 
when it comes to the keywords at the top, Stinky is one that's worth bearing in mind. It does have some relevances here and there. Balm doesn't have much synergies, but overall these keywords are like net neutral. They're absolutely fine. On the abilities front, you get plus one survival when departing. Survival's great. You may not have a high survival limit at the start of your campaign, but reaching that cap is amazing. Uh, this survival here in the early game basically represents a dodge or an encourage, so that is avoiding something terrible happening once per showdown, and hopefully it maxes out your survival when you depart. The second ability is low-key one of the best abilities in the early game. So it has two aspects to it. We'll talk about the second one first, which is if you have the priority target token, you get to remove it because you've smeared poop all over your face, and monsters don't like poopy survivors. Um, I can't really blame them. So that is a great, great thing to do. But the second aspect of this is amazing. And you're probably going to want to create yourself a tracking system of some kind, uh, a token that marks that someone is not a threat. So there are two ways you can use this. The first one is if you're caught out of position and you're badly injured or you have no armor and you're looking at say a white lion and you know it's going to target the nearest threat in front of it which is how white lions typically behave you can pop this to not be a threat which means if somebody else is in the facing like a better armored survivor boom they take the hit you don't that's fantastic there's also an entirely different category of survivor who play what's called a support role and Either they will run a spear for occasional attacking uh, with the spear specialization that helps trigger a trap without suffering the drawbacks sometimes, or if you're a fist and tooth survivor and you just want to do that one punch and get your fist and tooth weapon proficiency tick and then not attack the monster again because you're doing other things like deck manipulation, removing bleeding tokens, perhaps playing an instrument, that kind of stuff, then you can activate this and you can sit there and just be comfortable. Interestingly, both the White Lion and the Butcher, they don't exactly know what to do with stuff when they're not threats. The White Lion does have an instinct that will allow it to sniff and then it will um, classify you as being a target. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it, get, it counters this ability for a turn. The Butcher, on the other hand, um, really struggles to ever target non-threatening survivors. The most it does is knock them over and menace them and then gain some insanity. So there is a whole category of survivor who literally just pops onto the board and then goes, hi, I'm not a threat. I'm going to sit over in the corner and I'm going to help everyone with, through my mental abilities of, of, of rawhide headband and, and cat eye circlet and that kind of stuff. So the first Fecal Salve is, in my opinion, a must purchase, but sometimes you get more, and the reason for that is this affinity here. So affinities, this is the first time they appear here, so I'm going to briefly talk about them. The more affinities, the better. But certain orientations of affinities are way stronger than normal, and we're actually going to see the reasons why further on through these cards as we discuss them. Uh, but on blue, left or right blue is really, really good. Uh, down facing blue is also decent, but left and right are the best. So this has a left facing blue. That's going to combine with raw high dharma and another item in this video that we will look at. Uh, and it's going to be absolutely fantastic. Let's go on to the green reason why, you know, for the reason that green affinities are really strong. And here it is. This is Monster Grease. Monster Grease costs two organs. Uh, prior to 1.6, I believe, it cost one organ. It was too good at one organ, and you just make four copies of it. I think two organs is a very fair and well-designed cost for this item. Um, so that's fantastic. On the keyword front, it has consumable. That's kind of a neutral. Uh, description in neutral keyword soluble is a negative stinky can be a positive uh, if used correctly and flammable is a negative so this has a lot of negative keywords negatraits as I sometimes call them and in particular soluble and flammable can cause it to archive itself 
so that's something you want to bear in mind. However, what you get for Monster Grease is plus one evasion. Evasion is amazing. Evasion can be stacked on top of other evasions, so on top of itself being able to do this and give plus one evasion and plus one evasion for two evasion, it could also potentially stack with Rawhide Armor, which has a plus one evasion, or with Survivor of the Fittest that has a plus one evasion, or Tall Grass that has evasion if you're standing in it as well. Evasion is amazing. Now, the big thing to note is you don't really want these days more than maybe two copies of Monster Grease. One for whoever is going to be your main frontline character, and a second one for somebody who is going to occasionally step up and take a hit, but maybe they don't do it all the time. It's unlikely you're going to build a third one. You may do, but it's less valuable than the first and second copy. So my general play these days is to make... Uh, hey Pamsha, hi, she's a good girl, um, is to make uh, two monster greases and that will do me just fine unless I start heavily leaning on leather. Uh, we'll talk about leather, specifically leather armor, when we get to it. Uh, that's where this ability will first sort of get unlocked. But monster grease is one of the best items in the game, it's one of the best gear cards in the game you're going to get a huge amount of value out of this the earlier you make it. You're going to use it probably all the way until the end of the campaign. Certainly one copy, maybe even two. It's amazing. But I think we all know how good Evasion is at this point, so I'm going to stop beating that drum. On Affinity Front, this Affinity here is why you want other gear cards with a green Affinity on the right-hand side. Because it will connect to this and it gives you the first pip for getting towards this plus one Evasion. So that's where we get the value for this green affinity here being really good because it will work with this specific gear card. Now we have dried acanthus. Dried acanthus is made from a fresh acanthus and you can specifically make this be a part of your gear grids and everything, either through herb gathering, which I will talk about a little bit when I discuss the bonesmith, but also by hunting the Screaming Antelope, as a Screaming Antelope has six Acanthus plants on its board from the start. And while it likes to eat the Acanthus a lot, um, you should still be able to get a few copies of it. Dried Acanthus has perfectly fine keywords. There's no real negatives here. Consumable, minor negative, but it's, it's okay. And it has two abilities. The first one is incredible. When you depart, you get plus two survival. So that's amazing. Yeah, that will often cap out your survival to the settlement limit in the early game. But also it has this very unique ability on it here. When you suffer a severe injury, ignore it and archive this card instead. Sweet. So this is great protection for a number of different survivors. Uh, one idea that you can use this with is if you have a survivor who wields a two-handed weapon like a spear or certain types of axes or maybe a grand weapon, keeping a dried acanthus on them gives you a chance, because you choose when to trigger this, it gives you the, an opportunity in fact to ignore a dismembered arm so you don't lose access to your grand weapon survivor because they can't hold any grand weapons anymore because there are very few, there are some very few one-handed grand weapons. But the other uses for this are if you're going to be going into situations where you know severe injuries are going to occur. One of the most common this is employed upon is when you get to Courage 10, there's an event and that event will cause blind in one eye. But if you have dried acanthus in your gear grid when that happens, you can ignore it and archive the dried acanthus instead. That's great. Not having blind on a survivor with 10 courage is super useful. This is also commonly employed when fighting the Gorm, because if you get the death blow, the Gorm drops just an amazing resource that makes one of the best weapons in the game, full stop. And you have to take a blind in one eye while while somebody gets it from the death blow. Dried Acanthus gives you a survivor who can do that and they can pour Acanthus on their eye right after they get hit with all of the terrible stuff and instead of being blind, they just lose this, which is the value of one Acanthus. Really good card, really great. Sometimes you will go hunting screaming antelopes if you have them available 
simply for the purpose of getting some more acanthus to replace the ones you've already used. Uh, I, I think it's an absolutely superb card. And I really like how it doesn't have any affinities, which means number one, if you archive it, it doesn't break puzzle affinities elsewhere. And number two, it's a good balancing check for what is a very strong item. Speaking of strong items, let's get on to the Lucky Charm. Now, the Lucky Charm is, in my opinion, one of, if not the best gear cards in the entire game, and it is a focus around which so much of the game revolves. There is a way that, of playstyle where you slow down the fight as much as possible, and you're very methodical, and you try and line up all of the monster resource drop critical wound locations with the survivors who are capable of doing it. So Lucky Charm gives you plus one luck and each point of luck or deadly allows you to have an increased chance of causing a critical wound. The baseline is on a 10. With a deadly weapon, that is a nine or a 10 and with a Lucky Charm, that's an eight, nine or a 10. So that's 30% of the time when you wound, you will instead critical wound. On top of resource generation, critical wounds also allow you to bypass reactions. No matter how nasty the reaction is, you just get to have the critical wound reaction instead. So Lucky Charm's amazing, and we will look at some builds that specifically use the Lucky Charm for their like uses, uh, for their builds, and they're called Crit Farmers. Um, you can get them set up fairly quickly. Uh, the important thing is to make sure you have two blue affinities. Raw, raw Hide provides one of those two affinities and you can get the second one from either here or here. And this is why blue affinities left or right are considered to be the best because they connect to the Lucky Charm. Uh, the reason the down one's quite good is because many armor set pieces for the body have an up facing blue and that can be quite helpful to use. So that is the Lucky Charm and we have exactly one more piece of gear to look at from the organ grinder. Okay, so here is our final piece of item gear from the organ grinder. This is the Monster Tooth Necklace. You won't be able to craft this one early in the campaign because it requires a specific Endeavor keyword called Heat, which I will briefly look at before I finish here. Uh, finish the video, but uh, we'll, we'll, let's talk about this. So it's an item, jewelry and bone. As mentioned, jewelry is technically a negative keyword, but there are some things that like jewelry and it's not always going to be stolen away from you by white lions. One, because um, hopefully you don't get wiped against a white lion, but two, you can always have stone noses to protect, as I mentioned previously. The bone keyword is a big positive. You will find bone builds that want all bone uh, keywords on their gear, and they will get benefits from that. So it's always worth remembering that it has a positive material keyword here. The ability of this is gaining plus one strength, or plus one additional strength if you have two red affinities in your gear grid. The Monster Tooth Necklace itself provides a single red half affinity here facing to the right and that is why red affinities facing left are so good because it gets you most of the way to unlocking this. Now, I'm not going to pretend that strength is better than luck. It isn't. A survivor who critical wounds on a 2 plus is normally better than one who wounds normally with the exception of certain monsters that make a mockery of luck. Like the Butcher. The Butcher only has one critical hit location, so um, in those situations the Monster Tooth Necklace is outright just better. However, the big thing that the Monster Tooth Necklace does is it helps you transition from one monster to a higher level version of it or to a more dangerous monster. So, for example, the White Lion has eight toughness. Say you've got a three strength weapon and that announce and you know you're rolling 1d10 you've got no sharp you're typically going to be wounding on a five plus against the white lion that's 60 percent of the time that's pretty reasonable but if you go up against a phoenix with the same strength three weapon it's got 10 toughness suddenly you need a seven plus to score that wound that's that's a tall order you know that's not great you're going to get hit by a lot more reactions in that situation 
And that's where the Monster Tooth Necklace steps in. It'll help you because plus one strength, plus two strength, we can do that quite easily with a starting loadout. We get one red affinity from Rawhide. We can get another left facing red affinity from a basic bone weapon if we don't have anything better to use. And suddenly we've now got a strength five weapon. The strength five weapon is back to wounding on a five plus because five plus five is the 10 that we need. So this is low key really good. And I'm going to put my hand up and say it took me a long time to really come to appreciate the Monster Tooth Necklace and how it helps you transition from one phase of hunt gear to the next by just making your older weapons better and last a bit longer. So you're going to want to make Monster Tooth Necklaces. I would say you're going to be making at least two of them. You might make three or you may even in some circumstances deem it that four is the right number. There is far less, less diminishing returns on a monster tooth necklace than there is in ca the case of like other uh, types of gear cards. Uh, I think you get as much value from the third one as you can get from the first one, or close to. So that's the final gear I card item, and let's just quickly pop out of this, and we'll take a look at the crafting cost down here, which we can see it requires heat, and a scrap and a bone. So that's the scrap and a bone pictured here. Boom, boom. Um, and then heat. Now, heat will be like this. Uh, now, the lantern oven is given to you during the storyline of uh, People of the Lantern. So you don't need to try and make this. Um, but if you have a campaign where you're not going to get this through the timeline, and that's something you'll learn through experience of playing, it comes off ammonia, and ammonia is amazing because ammonia helps you make leather, and leather is really, really good. So this is a fantastic endeavor, uh, innovation, excuse me, innovation, and it's one you're going to be wanting to keep an eye out for to innovate if you can't get it through storyline progress. And it's also the first place where you'll get to start using your scrap, and it's a really good... Uh, thing just just making plus one plus two strength with these two resources absolutely fantastic and that's it that's the organ grinder thank you very much for listening uh, even through all of my flubs i do these all in one take so if i stammered or stuttered or uh, misspoke words here and there or you know please do forgive me if you like what you hear uh, usual call to action, you can click the subscribe button, you can give it a thumbs up if it was helpful to you. Uh, if you have any additional things that you like to use these gear cards for, this location for, or you have some really cool unique stories, I'd love to hear them. You can put them down in the comments. And if you want to support me making more of these kind of videos, I have a Patreon where I also do written articles every week on Kingdom Death for the most part, or sometimes other boss battlers. Uh, and you can support me making these videos here. Uh, if I can get enough support, I can get an editor and we can get rid of these flubs. But that's it for now. And happy adventuring in the dark. I will catch you in the next recording. Goodbye. <laughs>